Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We will introduce our guest in a minute, but first I wanted to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. This week, I wanted to plug a course by a friend and former housemate of our guest, Grandmaster Jesse Cry. He's out with Dojo's 1E4, including his recommendations in an E4 repertoire, including a spicy line in the Milner Berry Gambit. Uh, so that is definitely something worth checking out. And Chessable, of course, has tons of both free courses and per courses for purchase. And you can check out some of my own favorites at a link that I will post in the show description. Uh, for our guest this week, I am really excited to speak with him. He is a He was a U.S. prodigy, someone whose name I've been hearing in U.S. chess circles for decades. He had the record of the youngest U.S. national master until Hikaru Nakamura broke it in 1998. At age 15, he became the youngest American IM since Bobby Fischer. He did not end up becoming a professional chess player. He got a degree in political economy and statistics at UC Berkeley. Now he works in machine learning, but chess is still very much a part of his life. And he has a brand new book out with Quality Chess called How I Became a Chess Grandmaster. I read it. It's an absolute joy to read. And you, you learn about his life. You learn some chess. You learn some chess improvement. And I'm excited to talk about all those things with our guest, Grandmaster Vinay Bhatt. Welcome, Vinay. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me on. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I love this kind of book. Um, there, there aren't that many like it. Um, the one book that, and actually this is someone whose record you were affiliated with, Stuart Rachel's. I don't know if you're familiar oh, yeah. with Stuart Rachel's book. I know, I know of him, but um, somebody told me uh, afterwards uh, to check out how, I, I think it was The Best I Saw in Chess. Yes, The Best I Saw um, in Chess. And so John Donaldson gave me a heads up. He was like, hey, there's not, it doesn't feel like there's many books like this out there, but this other, it reminded him of Stuart Rachel's book. Yeah. And obviously you guys each have unique stories to tell and they're both fantastic books. But so to me, that's that's a very high compliment because I'm a big fan of that book as well. well and both you. and both of you guys, of course, are of different generations. So have different stories to tell um, about uh, so many sort of contemporary famous chess players and even legends of the game, which we will get to. But but I, I want to start with sort of what, what became a critical moment in your chess development. So you Take us through your whole development in the book, starting as a kid, and you were a uh, fast riser as a kid, of course, as anyone who holds the records that you do would be. But around the age of 2200, you did hit a tough spot. You kind of stagnated for a couple years, and you said that you didn't even necessarily notice so much at the time until you were looking back on it. So now that you do look back on it, uh, what do you think was, was behind uh, that kind of inevitable struggle, but struggle nonetheless? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think you're right to say it's probably inevitable. Like everybody hits a plateau at some point. Um, for me, I think there are probably a couple of things going on. One is that I loved playing so much that like it, even though I wasn't gaining many, like any rating points, I also wasn't losing a ton either. So I was, I was just call it plus or minus 10, 20 points over like two years. Um, and probably that like that joy was still there in playing. But for me, what what I was doing was really, uh, I kept studying the same things that took me to 2200. So I used to study uh, Morphe, Capablanca, tactics puzzles. And it's basically those three things, uh, just like kept doing them. And so one of the things I realized later on is that um, like there's, there's this like uh, aphorism or a dot, like, you know, cliche of like, run with the horses that brought you here. Mm -hmm. But instead, like, as I was playing better, better players, they were taking advantage of some of my weaknesses. So whether it was the openings or strategic play, things like that. And what I realized is like, there were parts of my game that were just really weak by comparison. I'd never studied them. Guys like Capablanca and Morphe, like they're great players, but you may not pick up everything from their games alone. And so uh, afterwards, it felt like that was like one of the big things that I was doing wrong. Um, that I, I felt like, oh no, if I just keep, if I keep looking at more Capablanca games, right. look at the same games over and over again, I'll get a little bit more information out of him and I'll get closer and closer to being able to play like him. But like some, some variety helps, I think. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it was around that time that you started working with Grandmaster Gregory Kadanov. Is that right? Yeah, actually, um, it was the end of the two year period where I started working with him. What I realized in writing the book was actually like my parents were much more aware of me getting stuck. Okay. Um, and so when I, uh, when I was talking to them about some of this, they actually had been debating 
even before the two years were up that like, Hey, maybe I should change coaches. Uh, but at the, I don't actually remember, I don't remember being in any of those conversations. Right. Um, but as soon as I worked, started working with Kaidanov, I think he quickly diagnosed some of those same things. So my study, like there were some things I kept from my old study habits, like, uh, you know, annotate your own games, look at your own games and try and learn from them. But in terms of other things, everything else changed basically. Um, we looked at different players' games, not Capablanca. We did calculation puzzles. He wanted me to change my repertoire just to experience different positions. Um, and actually, like with Kaidanov, it uh, the first year, all of a sudden, like I gained a hundred points, I think. Um, and he helped me all the way through the IM title and a little bit beyond that. Okay, yeah, and um, I had the privilege to interview Grandmaster Kaidanov, and we we talked in that in that he was a pioneer in doing chess lessons online or on phone, um, as as he talked about. And there's tons of great chess improvement advice in my interview with Grandmaster Kaidanov. But I'm curious uh, from that perspective, Vanessa, were you doing these lessons by phone? By phone. So um, we started in 1997. So uh, you can imagine that like pre cell phones were actually on a landline with each other. And both of us just had a chessboard in front of us. Um, and even though like I started playing on ICC probably right around then. So like people were started doing online lessons, but for whatever reason, we never migrated to ICC. The, like, you know, all our lessons for probably four years were all on the phone with like a physical board in front of us. And that actually like, even now I find it sometimes, uh, even when I was playing like my last tournaments, maybe like last time I played a classical tournament was 2014. Um, but even there to prepare, I brought a physical board with me because like, I'm just so used to seeing like the actual board and not just like a, like a computer screen. Yeah. Yeah. And in your, in your detailing of your relationship with Kaidanov, um, it struck me as sort of, you guys both sort of had a, a mature approach and maybe this developed um, more as time went on, but I was struck that even though you're a prodigy, I mean, you were the biggest name in chess. I, you know, I was older than you, like seven, eight years older than you. But I remember, you know, always looking at the top for the age group and seeing, you know, seeing your name. Um, but you guys de at some point consciously developed a plan where you said, hey, look, you know, I'm not going to study chess like, you know, 30 hours a week on my own. And you had to sort of structure a plan around that. Um, at what point did that sort of enter into the conversation with uh, Grandmaster Cardano? That was probably a little over a year into the like um, our student teacher relationship. Uh, I, it didn't start immediately. Um, I think we were debating, okay, like uh, what are some of the ways that I, like I should expand my repertoire and sort of like learn new positions, get better in some of like my weaker areas. And so like one of the discussion points was around like the Sicilian versus the French. Um, and I think the reality was is that like I was. Uh, I was still like pretty focused on school. And so I think we made the right call or like largely he made the right call, honestly, um, that like the French was going to be a, like a good opening for me to learn, but also not as much theory to remember uh, as like mainline Sicilians. Um, but yeah, actually, I think there's a lot of things that I feel like make a lot more sense to me now that I'm older. Right. Um, at the time, it's sort of like, well, he's like, he's like, great player, great coach, very nice guy. And so it was like, okay, like, yeah, I'll, I'll go with what he's suggesting. Um, but it, in retrospect, actually, it makes even more sense. Yeah. And I'm curious, Vinay, because you clearly have obviously a love for chess, but also a love for chess books. You describe a lot of the books you read. We'll, we'll get your, your recommendations later. But um, so how did it work in terms of like, you weren't willing to put in tons of time, or at least you, you could say you were prioritizing school, um, as you said, um, but you were reading books. So was the book reading more for fun or was it just like not enough in terms of uh, obviously Kadanov is someone who's worked with many of the, the top talents. Um, so how did, like, how did that work? Um, the book reading was like partly for fun and that's partly how I picked like game collections from players who I really enjoyed seeing their games. Uh, I definitely, like, I don't want to say that I didn't study chess. Like, I certainly study chess. It's just, um, I remember, like, uh, Kaidanov and I were literally talking about how many AP classes I might take in high school. Right. Uh, like, say, 10th grade, 11th grade, and what whatnot. 
Um, and I think that's where it was sort of like, oh, like I'm going to be spending a good amount of time studying uh, for like my exams and stuff like that. And so therefore, like I may have less time elsewhere. And so I think one of the things that I think he did a really good job of was like crafting a training plan for me that was like aware of how much time or effort I could put in. Um, I certainly played actually, like I played a bunch of tournaments. I read a good number of books. Um, but actually, like I imagine uh, if you ask Kadanov about like, was I like a super diligent student? I think right. he would probably say no. Uh, Cause there, he would often assign calculation problems to me for homework. And like, I would, I would do some of them or I would like kind of make a half attempt at some of them where I think he really wanted me to like sit and focus for like 10, 15 minutes on each problem. Um, and sometimes I was like, I was really interested in um, like kind of being a sponge for information. And then I really enjoyed playing. And so that's why like the books and then playing were always part of like whatever studying I did. It was sometimes harder for me to like be like, oh, I, I need to study openings or something, or I need to do calculation problems. That felt more like work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally understandable. Well, it's nice. I, you mentioned in the book, your parents were supportive and didn't push you too hard. And to have sort of the parlay of both like parents and a coach who are understanding is, um, you know, you can't take that for granted. No, for sure. Actually, I feel like um, there are a lot of like really talented junior players who I saw coming up. So whether in the US or in like world youth tournaments, but um, sometimes it felt like, yeah, like I, my parents were, they wanted me to do well. And like, if I'm, if I was, especially in high school, like if sometimes I was playing too many video games, my, like my parents would be like, Hey, like maybe you should like either do some schoolwork or you should <laughs> study some chess or like go play tennis, do something else. Um, but it never was, uh, they never really pushed me too hard for the results or got upset about, Hey, like if I wasn't performing, it didn't feel like, um, I saw them get upset at least. So that's nice. And did just out of curiosity as a parent, did, did your parents have, uh, like strict rules around video games? Uh, not a ton. I think, um, I think if my grades and stuff were suffering too much, then they probably like that's that was sort of a, you know, like how they would enter the conversation in a way. Right. Um, but so long as I was doing well, especially at school, which was like the main priority for them, um, that was then it was sort of like, OK, so I, I yeah, I remember senior year, especially, I think I was like <laughs> playing a lot more video games and like, but I managed to, to skate by in school. So what, what was your favorite game? Uh, so there, there were like, there were a few actually, um, I used to do, uh, a lot of like rally car racing games. Um, and then there was like a baseball game, like high heat, uh, 2000. Okay. Nice. Um, so I would, I would like play full like seasons. Um, Zelda was like a big one. Uh, but yeah, I think those were all like, that's where I spent a lot of time. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Yeah. Um, slightly later generation than my video games, but fun. Oh, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, let's uh, bring it back to uh, openings I found interesting in particular, because as you say, and as you write about in the book, Grandmaster Kadanov was helpful in making in designing you a repertoire that uh, wasn't too labor intensive. But you also switched um, repertoires around that time. And I wanted to give a shout out to a friend of the pod, Juan Miguel Gua Garcia, who just in time for our interview, linked me to your interview with uh, Sagar Shah over at Chess Base India. So we got to check that out. And in that, you talk about when you switched to D4. And he asks what your advice is in terms of uh, what openings to choose in according to your level and when a change might be in order. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. So for me, I felt like I was, um, I started playing D4 when I was about 2400 and I'd been stuck there for actually a couple of years. Yeah, so um, second plateau, right? Uh, second big plateau, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, there's, I think there are like three or four plateaus in my like chess career. It felt like, um, I don't think openings are terribly important at like sort of the very early stage. You need to bring your pieces out, but the like, you're not typically going to get a mainline position. Um, you know, when you're twelve hundred or thirteen hundred, there's a lot of things around tactics that I think are really important. Um, it takes some time also to develop a feel for any opening. So Kaidanov taught me the French defense. And before that, I'd always been playing double king pawn, e4, e5, with either openings like the Petrov or the Philidor. 
um, things like that. Uh, and I'd also been playing the center counter, the Scandinavian with E4, D5. Um, and when I first learned the French, I was probably about 2250-ish, um, maybe approaching 2300. And my first year results there, first six months were actually not that great. I, I lost a good number of games there where I didn't understand how to really sort of bring out my pieces in some of that. Like I hadn't played those kinds of central, like block central kind of positions. Um, and so I had to give it enough time to sort of like let it bake, let some of the lessons sink in. And actually then like at some point, the French made a ton of sense to me where I could play it, maybe not on autopilot, but I, I could play it for a long time. Part of the reason I switched was um, it, it helps to get experience in different positions. Like depending on how you want to learn, you can find that spend a few years on an opening uh, in one area. Um, if you notice your rating getting stuck somewhere, maybe that's a sign that, hey, like it's time to change it up. For me, I found that when I started playing D4, part of it was that I wasn't, um, I was getting a lot of the same positions after E4 that I'd been getting for a while. And I just realized I wasn't enjoying playing some of those positions anymore. And it took me a little, like, like a lot of things, it's like, oh, it's so obvious in retrospect of like, right. well, my mind wasn't in it for some of those games. Um, but playing D4 meant I just got a brand new thing from the get go. And so I started by playing the Trumpowski, like D4, Knight F6, Bishop G5, like not a, not a, like a theory heavy line. And even when I became a GM, I, I talk about this a little bit in the book of like, I used to pick lines that were popular from like the 1950s to the 1980s. Like right. I used to play, I for a long time, I used to seek out old lines that I felt like grandmasters had moved on from, but weren't sort of dead equal. Um, and I, 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 like I did reasonably well in a lot of openings against even GMs where um, you don't have to play always the main lines. It helps sometimes you can, learn about new positions. Uh, but I would say like short answer for sort of, um, for the question would be around sort of like rating plateaus. You're feeling like, Hey, uh, I'm not getting as much joy from playing some of these middle game positions. Those are probably good signs to, to try and switch it up. That makes sense. And I'm guessing that, as you mentioned, your first plateau around 2200, you were only 10 to 11 years old. By the time you have your 2400 plateau, was it much more a point of frustration at that point? Were you more aware of it? I was definitely more aware of it. And that's actually the first plateau that I really remember. Or like mm -hmm. when I was putting this together, that was the one that I was like, oh yeah, I need a, that's, that's where like some of the meat will be of like piecing together what I studied, what I could have done differently. Um, I think also part of the reason I ended up getting stuck at 24, like 2400 for longer was because I was getting frustrated. And so I like, I, I started by playing a number of tournaments and then I pulled back a little bit from chess, uh, because I was, you know, like when you know, you're not doing as well, or you don't, you're not doing as well as you feel you can, it's easy then to sort of get frustrated. And like, I had other interests. So like, um, I stopped playing actually for like a couple of years on top of the two year, like normal plateau, I stopped playing for another two years. Cause I was just like, ah, like, this isn't working for whatever reason. And that was when you were at university? Yep. Yeah. So um, my first two years at Cal, actually, basically, I, I didn't play any tournaments. And then um, I tried to play one tournament, the US Junior, and it went really poorly. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. I, 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 obviously, that's a high level of competition. So it's tough to just, uh, <laughs> you know, walk off of campus into, into um, a cauldron like that. Um, no, I, I, I think what I found is that I had lost some of the mental stamina to like mm -hmm. just focus. So like the first game of the tournament, I could really focus, call it the second game, third game. Yes. But by like the fifth, sixth, all the way to the ninth game, my mental focus was just like not there for various reasons. I just I also wasn't used to like just thinking like that for three, four hours in, in a row. Yeah. Yeah. It, there, there's nothing. There's not much else like it. And Vinay, I'm curious more sort of big picture, like this has to have been quite, um, you know, an interesting process for you to sit, you know, dig out those old scorebooks. I know you mentioned in the book that like you, you luckily did keep very good records and you say your memory is at least for a grandmaster, not amazing, but to like go through all those games and try to recreate the memories and contextualize your whole career. Like 
How did that whole process feel? And I'm curious if there are any like conclusions you drew that that maybe you wouldn't have expected going in. Oh, I, I, good question. Because I think actually, um, well, one, I, I do think my record keeping has been like, I have a lot of my old score books. Uh, it took me a while. Like I remembered playing David Bronstein in a Blitz game. Right, yeah. But, like I actually found the score sheet. Like I have like wow. boxes of chess related stuff. Um, but also I think for me, some distance has helped. Like I don't feel like, I, I haven't been playing regularly since the end of 2010. My last classical tournament was 2014. I play a rapid or blitz tournament here or there. Um, but I feel like even if I wrote, if I started writing in say 2013 or 2014, I feel like it still would have been a slightly different book. Um, that looking back, I had a lot of my old notes. Um, like one of my early teachers, uh, like while I was stuck at 2200, uh, Mr. Polovets really helped me by like sort of um, getting me to understand that analyzing my own games was like re- going to be really beneficial. So that was like one of the main chess things I did. And all of those were handwritten. Um, and I know like um, he mentioned Jesse Cry, for example. Right. I, I know Jesse was, is definitely I a big it was believer going in to Jesse. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> And so like, I, I actually have notebooks and Kaidanov was very supportive of that. So I have notebooks, even from when I was working with Kaidanov, of like, I had chess base on the computer, but I didn't originally start entering all my annotations in there and, until I like, call it 1998, 1999. Um, but a lot of those notes still had some of like how I felt during the game or what I was thinking of. And like, um, so that helped form some basis. Uh, and then there were some things where like certain key games stand out to me of like key patterns or what I felt in certain moments. Even if, uh, if you ask me to like replay one of the, maybe like one of my games from when I was 10, like I certainly won't remember in general. And, but when you look at them, does it start to come back to you? Yeah, I think some of like playing at the Colty club. So like the local, um, chess club in Campbell, California, like just sort of what that community center was like, um, and then like you see some photos and you, you remember, oh yeah, like this was the environment too. Uh, so I, I think some of it comes back and it's like, um, yeah, like there are some stories in about like playing with sort of analog clocks and like, right. Um, right? And it's like just sort of the feel of a tournament um, where I remember uh, there was a world youth in Hungary where it was like, it was basically over 40 Celsius, a hundred degrees Fahrenheit, like in um, Zeged at the time. And so like they were asking people after the first round to bring in like lots of water because some kids actually like basically had heat stroke uh, during like the first round. Um, and so like I, some of that, I, I, I definitely remember more some of the world youth experiences, uh, working with some of the coaches, um, things like that. Some of the uh, like a blitz session, with, like there was actually a world youth tournament where um, I didn't remember actually a lot of the specific games, even who I played, but what still is in my memory, like very clearly now was like, there was a rest day in the middle of the tournament and I, I was playing blitz for like four or five hours with, um, Mark Paragua and, uh, Tamor Rajapov. Mm-hmm. And it was just three of us like just trading blitz games. Um, and like that, that's actually what stood out to me from like that entire tournament, not like anything else from like the actual world youth championship. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean. I'm sure I'm sure it was an amazing experience. Um, and uh, hearing you um, discuss writing your annotations to the game reminded me that I wanted to ask you about the one page opening write ups. Uh, could you uh, tell us a little about that? Oh, yeah, for sure. So like um, you you mentioned that, like, I, I don't think of myself as having like a great memory for a chess player. And like uh, all of us in the chess house used to joke about like my basically hallucinations where I I either would think I knew something and it was like totally made up or I just totally forgot stuff. Um, but for some of my openings, especially the main ones I would, I would play. So like the French defense, for example, I actually would have like, um, a one page write up of some key lines and positions or themes to keep in mind. And usually that was meant to be like, I could look at that before a game, if I was say playing the black pieces and I. I knew my opponent was going to play e4 or like could seriously play e4. Um, that would be sort of a last minute sort of refresher uh, of, hey, here are some key positions and themes. And often I would highlight uh, not so many variations, uh, but 
positions where I felt like I may not actually be able to understand what the right plan was just from looking at the position, for example. Um, even though I played like the French at that point for more than a, more than a decade, um, there were still plenty of things that I would forget. Uh, and that was just like a nice little um, refresher for me. I feel like my short-term memory is pretty good, but my long-term memory, like it, it starts to fall apart. Okay. Yeah. First of all, I wanted to tell you the the Karpov Sarawan thing made me LOL. When I was <laughs> no, I, I was so convinced, um, which is why like Jesse, Josh, David, they all still joke about that. Right. Um, because I was so convinced that I was following this rook and pawn technique from Karpov Sarawan, which was like a game that never like they certainly played games, but they never right. had any any game that looked like this. <laughs> It's it's too funny. And on the topic of the uh, opening write ups, was this also done with paper and pen? Uh, one, I think the French one I did, but eventually I like I was traveling enough that I just actually had like sort of a basically a Google Doc or Word Doc. That and is it literally one page? Like because it, it seems to be like one what page. you like, literally one like page. a lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, um, no, like I I think so. Um, so for the French, for example, I had one page. Uh, one page was entirely the winner. And then one page for everything else, basically, in the French. Um, similarly, so the semi-Slav, like the Moran lines was like one page. But what I would try and do is just like have some key prompts for myself. Because I, I would always remember some of the basic moves, no matter what. But sometimes even like a move number would help me remember at the board. It was like, oh, yeah, it's supposed to be on move 13 that I'm like supposed to be playing this move. So like I can't play it right now. Right. There's got to be like something else, right? And I think sometimes you just need those those cues, at least I needed those cues um, to be like, oh yeah, like how do I do this? Because there, there was a game against actually, um, I think it was Irina Crush where I was convinced I was following a line I had played against another, like another grandmaster a year before. Um, and I, like I, I drew the, I was black, uh, it was a semi-slav and I drew the game against Irina, but I remember thinking afterwards, like this wasn't as easy as I remember the other game against like this 2600 GM. Um, and then I looked at it later and I was like, I, I had actually just not played the same line exactly. <laughs> and so I was the first to deviate, but like at the board, I just, I, I didn't remember. Okay. Well, trust me, this stuff is all too relatable for us mortals. So uh, we, we appreciate uh, you sharing these stories. You've met so many people, you're friends with so many people from the chess world. So if you're up for it, I thought what we might do is um, I could give you some names and you could free associate. Right. Does oh, that sound okay, good? Okay. All okay. right. So Th since he was just on the podcast, let's start with who was then I am when, when <laughs> you knew him best. Now GM Sam Shanklin. S Sam is actually, um, Sam is like a very driven person. Uh, and I started working with him pretty early on. So he, he bounced around actually all of our chess house kind of, uh, you know, um, teachers basically. So he started working with Andy Lee, who I've known for, I don't know, 25 years, then David Proust, then myself, then Josh Friedel. Um, Sam is like, like, he's a very hard worker. He's passionate. Um, that was one of the things that maybe, even though he started playing chess a little bit later than most juniors, um, like his energy for the game was, uh, was like obvious. And I think actually teaching him was actually part of the reason that I, even though I wasn't playing at the time, I felt like I actually got better just by teaching him, even when he was like, call it 1800 to 2200. Um, I feel like I, I really got better as a chess player. Uh, -huh. so like I, I owe a lot of thanks to Sam actually. Okay. That makes sense. And let me ask you, because that certainly comes across in his interviews, his, uh, you know, no nonsense, very hardworking and inspiring yeah. in that sense. But he also says he's not talented. And I, someone like Greg Chahadi, who, of course, runs the U.S. chess school, has said that, like, the first time Sam came to a U.S. chess school, he said, this kid is, is something special, you know. So can you help us square that circle? Like, how would you evaluate Sam's talent? I I think there's, uh, I think, I feel like Kasparov said this once of like the capacity to work is also a talent. Ah, oh, that's an excellent um, point. Yeah. And so I think that's where like Sam, I think there's some stuff about like pattern recognition, memory, uh, and just like a feel sometimes for where the pieces should go that he has, but maybe it's not, um, maybe rightly or wrongly, he doesn't feel like it's at the same level of like when we talk about somebody like Ivanchuk or something, right. uh, but 
I think one of the things that differentiates him and like all the top guys really have to have it uh, is like this capacity to work. And I feel like Kasparov had highlighted before that, you know, like he was obviously very talented, but he layered on sort of that really sort of high level of dedication. And you look at like other sports too. I feel like um, somebody like Steph Curry, like I'm, I'm a Warriors fan, uh, but like Steph is out there shooting and practicing, like training all the time. Um, and I think you see that as like what you see on the court in the game is often sort of the byproduct of some of that. Uh, and so I think maybe in sort of the, maybe in like a very limited sense, maybe Sam is trying to describe himself as that, but I think he's selling himself short. Cause I, like, I do actually think the capacity to work is part of like actually, uh, what talent is. Okay. That's, that's a brilliant insight. Uh, I appreciate that. All right. Another Bay area. Uh, star, a little younger than you, uh, Daniel Naroditsky. Oh, okay. Um, Danya is like, man, this guy, uh, I, I feel like when I started seeing him, he was like this tiny little kid. <laughs> uh, and I think there might even be a photo in the book of like us playing in the same U S chess league team where he's like curled up on a seat. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Danya is a lot of fun to be around. Um, I haven't seen him in a couple of years now. I think he's in North Carolina. Yep. Uh, but, um, sometimes when he's around the Bay, like we've grabbed dinner, uh, with some other friends. Um, I worked with him really briefly actually. So I, I, I was never really a proper trainer for him. I was like a sparring partner. Um, but, uh, I, th I feel like he could be actually a lot stronger than he is. I feel like he, he stopped playing a lot of tournament chess. Um, but he still shows his talent because he's like one of the best, like, blitz and bullet players in the world yeah um and you, like you can see like the guy loves the game um so he's high level talent for sure yeah yeah it definitely comes across and an amazing educator to boot all right yep. and then you've got of course a great uh, magnus carlson story so <laughs> let's hear that magnus was um meeting magnus was interesting i think he's he's probably the most competitive person i've ever met like personally um when i met him uh, so like giving some context to it, um, there's a businessman entrepreneur here, um, named Joe Lonsdale Jr. Uh, Joe and I went to the same Fremont public library class, uh, when we were, you know, seven or eight years old. Um, it was every Friday, uh, Joe then became associated with Peter Thiel. Uh, Peter Thiel was also like a 2200 player who I actually played a few times growing up. Um, and. Magnus was visiting the Bay Area to uh, go to Facebook, go to a few other companies like that. Um, and so I was invited to this dinner. Uh, and as like almost like I wasn't the only other chess player, but I was like the only other title player. And um, Magnus, so like I had seen him before uh, at some tournaments, um, but I never actually talked to him. And so when we introduced each other, he really shocked me by like, explaining how he knew of me. Um, and there was a game from, I had played against this Chinese player, uh, now a very strong GM, but at the time, I think he was an IM, Wang Yue. Uh, and um, it showed up in New and Chess. It was from a US-China match. It was like kind of a big deal at the time, it felt like that match. Um, and in this game, I had gained an advantage. I'd won an exchange, but then I wasn't able to like convert the advantage. Um, and Magnus was telling me about this of like, oh, I heard about you then. Um, and I was like, dude, that was like 2002. And we were talking in 2014. Right. Um, and he's explaining some stuff to me about the game. And I'm like, my God, like your memory is both insane at this point. Uh, but then we played some bug house. Um, we played a blitz game. He came across as being uh, both like friendly, but also like extremely competitive. And I could see him as like, I think for some of the guys who reach the top, most of the guys who reach the top, whether it's in chess or other sports, like you have to be, you have to have some of that special drive. Um, and he, he definitely has some of it. Um, our blitz game was like pretty competitive. I thought it was like one of the, one of the better games that like I had played uh, basically at that point. Um, I feel like I had a, I, I mean, like I clearly had a winning end game actually, but I, I managed to blow it. Um, in the last 30 seconds of the game. But like at the time I was like, oh my God, I like I, I missed a chance against the world champion. Um, but then I, I went back to my day job 
Uh, and right. like a week later, it felt like, okay, like it's not the end of the world. So Yeah, but still, I mean, but yeah, amazing story. And yeah, obviously not the only story like that that's been told on the pod, but still just never ceases to amaze uh, those feats of memory that just like seem to come by accident to Magnus. All right. We're going to take a bit of a hard left, and I want to hear about someone less well-known to those outside the U.S., but always seems to be good for a chuckle, uh, Grandmaster Edward Gufeld. <laughs> oh. um, Gufeld, uh, he, like, he'd come to the Bay Area a couple times in the mid-'90s um, to do some uh, like lessons and like group lessons. Um, so I think he, Eric Schiller had arranged a couple sort of like group classes like that. I picked up his book, um, maybe My Life in Chess, uh, and like Gufeld, for those who don't know, is he's an entertaining character. He's a very passionate, or he was a very passionate person about chess, um, and it comes across in his book, I think. But like somehow his style didn't mesh with mine. Um, his and then style we played... didn't mesh with a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and so we we ended up playing at um, in Las Vegas. It's North American Open, and it's uh, 1999. And so like. I'm not on board one, but I think we're playing on like maybe board three or four. And next to me is Alex Yermolinsky playing somebody else. And um, Gufeld, he has the white pieces. I have the black pieces. The opening is actually like, it's an interesting opening. I start to outplay him in the middle game. And at some point he offers me a draw. Um, and he hasn't made his move yet. So I, I tell him, hey, like you've got to make your move first, then you offer a draw. And he's already getting a little annoyed at me um, <laughs> for that. And then the game starts to slip from like, I was already a little bit better. Um, and then I like added to the advantage and pretty soon I was just winning the, winning the game. And once he resigned, like basically it felt like you could see his blood pressure, like rising, like a vein shows up in his forehead. Like I just lost, like, how did I lose this game? So he stops the clocks. He's not like, doesn't want to shake hands. He, makes a show of like crumpling up the score sheet and throwing it away uh, right in front of me on this, like, and this, the stage at, in Vegas is like, it's slightly roped off from most spectators. Um, and so while he's doing all this, he's muttering some stuff to himself. Uh, and I, at first I was like, oh, I'm just not hearing what the words are. And then I realized it probably wasn't in English. Um, and so I turned to Yermo, uh, who's like, Yermo and his opponent are already like, they're already distracted by all this. So like right. they are playing their game, but they're not, they're not really like in the game at the moment. Right. Um, and I asked Yermo, I was like, Hey, so like, do you know what he's saying? Uh, and Yermo, I, I, like, Yermo's like, I think you can guess. I, you don't need me to translate what he's saying right now. <laughs> right. So, um, which I thought was like, at that point, I thought it was hilarious. Um, I think it, part of the thing is that like, chess players outside, especially the chess community, I feel like they have a reputation for being very, uh, like maybe regimented or very always logical. It's almost like it's a game for people like Spock who are like emotionless in a, in a way, but actually like there's a lot of emotion in chess. You see a lot of characters. Um, I, I know like Gufeld and I, like we maybe never, our styles never meshed for sure, but like um, I thought it was entertaining and it's like, Actually, if you're a chess player, you see a lot of this in tournaments where like, yeah, people people get worked up. <laughs> I like how you say your styles never meshed when really it's just like, you know, a hundred people have stories of Goofo oh, going yeah. on like <laughs> epic tilt after. <laughs> um, but but nonetheless, uh, funny stuff. All right. Uh, here's another one for you, Vinay. Uh, Riza from the Wu-Tang Clan. Oh, uh, he's one of my, probably one of my musical heroes, really. Um, so... Uh, actually, for a long time, I thought about starting every chapter with like a lyric or rap lyric of some kind. Right. Um, but then I decided like this may not be the audience for the book may not really appreciate the music as much. I, I would have, but go on. Oh, nice. OK. I, you grew up closer to New York. So like, yeah. um, but uh, I think um, for me, like music is something that's always been in my life. So like as a little kid, my parents were always playing music at home, not like rap for sure and not Wu-Tang, but still music is something I've been around like my whole life and call it in the mid, I, I didn't start listening to Wu-Tang right when they dropped their first album in 93, but it was like, call it um, a few years later and they basically became my favorite sort of rap group, rap artist. And uh, I had a chance to meet the RZA um, at a hip hop and chess federation, hip hop and chess sort of event in 
uh, the Bay Area. So there have actually been multiple of them. Um, for for any uh, listeners out there who are like uh, underground rap aficionados, like hieroglyphics have been at some. Oh, nice. Um, so uh, more of a Bay Area representation. But this one with RZA was uh, RZA, Josh Waitskin, myself. Um, and so we, uh, we had an event in Palo Alto and uh, RZA and both his cousin, I think, um, the genius, Jizza the genius, uh, they're both actually pretty big chess players. They're super passionate. Um, actually, they just held, they're in, um, I believe, Australia or New Zealand right now. And they just held a charity like chess tournament there. Yeah, I saw that as um, well. So yeah, I, I just saw that in the news. But I think they play super regularly. Um, and for me, it was like, it was like almost starstruck of like, I'm seeing this guy in person who I've like, his music I've listened to for at that point, more than a decade. Uh, who I really respect is like both a person and like an artist. Um, and what was funny is he's asking me for some chess advice and I am just like, I'm drawing blanks. I'm like, oh no, what do I say first? Then you move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's like, uh, yeah. And so I ended up telling him, well, like maybe you could play what like I play right now. Um, <laughs> but, and then afterwards, so like I was playing things like the King's Indian attack and stuff like that. And um, afterwards I was like, oh my God, Vinay, like, why were you telling him all these things? Like, those are not the right openings for somebody who's, I think at the time, probably like 1400, 1500 level. Um, and I was like, he shouldn't be playing those openings. Like, uh, but it was like the first thing that came to mind. So, so what would you tell him if you could do it all over again? Oh, I, I would, I would stick to more classical openings, um, for sure. I think he was somebody who, uh, I, I think when he was describing sometimes like how he would get stuck in certain positions. Uh, he was actually playing a lot more closed, like center kind of positions where he didn't understand sometimes how to maneuver his pieces around afterwards to figure out like, what do I do next? And so like start by playing E4, Knight F3, like play the classical openings, the open games, bring your knights and bishops out. It becomes a little bit easier then because all your pieces have some squares typically. Okay. Um, but I think that was one of the things and like, that was one of the reasons why the King's Indian attack probably wasn't a good suggestion for him because like... <laughs> right. Yes, like the first seven, eight moves are like very easy to play, but it's still a pretty strategic opening. And it's not, um, even though attack is in the name, you're often not actually attacking. Huh. Yeah. And and you mentioned in your book, and this came up earlier, you you say openings weren't a big priority for you until the the NM level, um, until the 2200 level. Yeah. Is is that something you would dare tell the RZA? Or if he asked you for opening advice, are you just going to tell him some openings? Oh. I, I would probably, I would give him some basic moves, but yeah, I, I don't think openings are like a, that big a deal for, um, I, I think once you get to call it like 1800 onwards, the openings probably matter a little bit more, but um, I was actually still playing stuff like the Elephant Gambit when I was right. like 2100. Uh, and like, I did, I did okay with it. Um, I do think it's probably a little bit more risky now. I feel like modern chess information, like people have more information at their fingertips. So some of the like, you know, sideline or sketchy openings can get you into more trouble now than I feel like maybe they did in sort of the nineties. But um, in general, I think like when you're 1400, 1500, you're often not getting the position that like in the Sicilian books, they're explaining, they're spending like a whole chapter on, you're probably actually not getting to that position. So it's, it's almost like you need something simpler where like you understand how to bring out the pieces and for me that was um yeah like something my first coach outside of my mom told like taught me the 30 rules of chess by Ruben Fine and that had some general principles of like okay how do you want to bring your pieces out how might you formulate a plan things like that and there's there's a lot of versions of this right like Jeremy Silman is like super famous in the US and rightly so for like uh his books on reassess your chess amateur's mind and so on and he presents like different ways of getting to sometimes the same conclusions of how do you, how do you start to formulate a plan when your opponent plays um, some moves that you don't expect? And I think when you're 1300, 1400, it's often going to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. And I did wonder about that when you gave that advice, because definitely like the, the landscape has gotten more, more competitive. Oh, for um, sure. Yeah. Over the years. Okay. Co a couple more people I want to hear your reflections on. You mentioned um, encountering a young Wesley So and Caruana and being uh, quite impressed with them. I think it was in 2006. 
Yeah. Um, actually, so Wesley, uh, I played him at an international tournament in San Marino. It's a small republic nestled on like the Italian coast. Um, and I, I played actually pretty well in that tournament. I beat some 2,600 grandmasters. Wesley So was, I think, 2,300 at the time. And he beat me in our game. And afterwards, Mark Paragua, who I've known for like decades, uh, he pulls me aside and basically says like, Wesley is the most talented chess player I've ever seen. Uh -huh. um, and at the time I was like, all right, he's like, he's a kid, he's 2300, he's good. But um, I like, I didn't quite understand at the time, just from one game, like what level of talent he was. Um, but obviously I think like for somebody who hasn't had as much formal training sometimes as some of the other top players, like he's been a fixture in like the 2750 plus community for a while. Um, but yeah, I, I think I actually didn't have much of a chance in that game. He made a GM norm. I think that might have been his first GM norm, actually. Uh, and then Fabiano I met um, in 2006 in Spain, where I think he was living with, uh, I think they were living in Spain, maybe in Madrid at the time. Um, and he was another person who, like, uh, Fabi, I felt, was, like, working harder at chess, maybe with coaches. Wesley was working hard, maybe, with either people like Mark Paragua or, like, on his own. Um, I, f I felt like Caruana was working probably more with formal coaches, but like similar passion for the game and similar talent in a lot of ways. Uh, just like, I, like, I, I feel like, you know, I have some skill for sure at chess, but like these guys are like, wow. Okay. Like I, I sometimes don't, even now it's like hard sometimes to understand like how they make some of the associations or how they find some of the solutions that they find. Yeah. Yeah. And it's only from hearing it from people like you that it really puts in perspective, uh, uh, the, the level those guys are, are at. All right. Uh, last but not least on the association front, we got to get the the scouting report of uh, what Jesse Cry, David Proust and, uh, and Josh Friedel. Oh, Josh didn't live with you. So what the what the two uh, chess dojo guys, what were they like as roommates? <laughs> oh, actually, so like um, I loved living with them. Uh, I think we had uh, a five bedroom house in Richmond, uh, California. So just north of Berkeley. Um, they were a lot of fun to be around actually. I think like Jesse brings a lot of energy all the time. And like, you can, you can see it if you like, uh, if you ever interact with him, you watch any chess dojo kind of video, I feel like you can see the energy he brings. Um, David is somebody who I've known since the mid nineties. Like, uh, I probably don't see him as often now that he's got three kids. Right. Um, but, uh, he lives actually just like not too far away from me. So, um, we hung out maybe just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he came over, um, but both those guys are people who like, I've known for a long time and who I think, uh, the chess house was interesting because like we had a rotating cast of other people sometimes coming through. Uh, and some of those other people, I felt like either like they didn't play, they didn't understand sometimes like how to use the dishwasher or how to <laughs> use the stove, like a gas stove, or we had so many clogged bathrooms from guests who are staying at our place <laughs> <laughs> that is like i think jesse jokes about me wearing like almost like a hazmat suit to like clean up one of the messes <laughs> um unfortunate but uh but yeah I, I think um for me the chess house was also interesting because like as much as i love those guys when we first started working together i actually struggled a little bit to like we all struggled i think um our styles were probably different and our learning styles were probably a little different. And so all of us actually, we all moved in together thinking we'd train together, we'd all get better. And then it was like six months in, a year in, all of our ratings had actually just gone down. Hmm. Um, so either we were having too much fun with each other, uh, just being around like sort of a, like a group of friends, or I think some of our training methods probably could have been better too. Okay. And Vinay, you mentioned a bunch of chess books. Obviously, your passion for for reading generally um, and chess books in particular um, is evident. Um, so I'm curious. Well, first of all, because you do give some recommendations in the book, but so do you keep up with chess literature much? Not so much. Um, there's actually, uh, well, you were actually on this episode, I think, with the Chess Dojo guys about um, maybe the top 10 books. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, and so I have not bought many chess books over the past, call it decade. I bought Sam Shanklin's books um, just because like, I, I want to support Sam. I also like, I haven't, I can't say I've read the second volume, but mm -hmm. I have it. Okay. Um, and then uh, from your episode, actually, um, 
there were a couple books that maybe David recommended and Jesse recommended New York 1924. Maybe you recommended as well, which I had not ever seen or like, um, I never like looked at that book. So I actually picked that up. Um, but did you look at it? Sorry. But did you look at it? That's the big, I have looked at some of the games. I can't say I I finished reading it. Um, Mm -hmm. but it actually, like, I, I can see why, like, it's, uh, actually really engrossing. I think if I had found it when I was like playing more regularly, uh, and I actually went through all the games and like the actual annotations more closely. I feel like, well, one, I think it would have been like a really valuable book actually, but also would have been like, a. it would have, I, I, I think I enjoy now more hearing more about like the context and the history of things. Um, and so like, I think that would have also like sort of played into that. Um, and then I picked up, uh, I found this, I'm not sure exactly how like somebody gave this book up, but Mikhail Tall's uh, Best Games, mm-hmm. uh, which I think was maybe on yeah. a couple people's lists. Yeah, I mean, Jesse's uh, guess- always talking about uh, Tal Botvinnik, but My Life in Games is, I think, also made it. Yeah, I think um, I we had actually studied Tal Botvinnik 1960 in the chess house, and I feel like that book also made a big impression on me. Um, but I'd never seen sort of Tall's like longer sort of autobiography. Um, and I stumbled across that. I have flipped through more of that and I felt like that was like an amazing book. Um, I wish, maybe I wish I like had come across that earlier as well. Cause I feel like it would have been both like a good read, but also helped my chest in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, it's still shameful that I've, uh, I've not read Talbot but I do, I do like my life in games and can, can recommend that. And I think um, you're reading plenty of books. So. <laughs> <laughs> Feels that way to me. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and um, on a related note, the aforementioned Juan Garcia, who had sent in a question for you uh, also enjoyed your interview with uh, chess base India. And he said to mention that the, how not to play chess book that you mentioned where yeah. you forgot the author, it's Eugene Snosko Borowski. And he said that the book is recommended by Kasparov himself. And oh, I'm actually okay. not familiar with that one. So could you tell us a, a little bit more about it? Um, so this is a book that I, I don't remember a ton of details about it, but I feel like I came across it at the Mechanics Institute chess library. Um, so like the Mechanics Institute is like a old sort of building in San Francisco and they have both a library plus a, like a longstanding chess room since call it like mid 1800s. Um, and I got a library card there probably in the like mid late nineties. And I felt like I came across a ton of chess books. Um, the author's name sounds familiar. Uh, Zinosko Borowski. I want to get, say it was probably written in like the 1940s, maybe early wow. 50s. Okay. Um, and I, I think it, like I had been told to like, initially I'd been told to analyze my own games and understand, like learn from your mistakes, things like that. But also this book felt like a lot of ways, like, okay, again, it's like you learn from sort of how not to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, there's actually, you don't just win by losing and so on. Like sometimes you actually have to like, or sorry, you don't just learn by winning. Sometimes you have to lose every so often to understand, okay, like what do I need to work on next? If you just keep playing beginners who you're always going to beat, like, sure, you you may not get, you may feel good about the result, but you're not going to get better in a way. Um, but yeah, that that's a book that, the the title made a big impression on me and i feel like i learned a little bit of like why uh how you can learn from like both good and bad results uh but i i i I wouldn't be able to say like what some of the chapters were about okay yeah i mean it's been a while and how often you know you do mention so many books you mentioned being a fan of irving chernov um you know as many of us are um how often would you say you were reading when you were a kid like how many hours a week were you reading chess books Ooh, um, how many hours? I feel like I would guess actually it was like a good number of hours a week. So Irving Chernev, especially there was Capablanca's best chess endings. Um, I started with logical chess move by move, Capablanca's best chess endings, the most instructive games of chess ever played. Those three really stand out to me as ones that I like. Uh, I think when David Proust was over here a couple weeks ago, he was looking at my chess book shelf and he was like, uh, the most well-worn books on my shelf are like, uh, it's organized kind of like almost by year or player. And so like the top left is Morphe. And then it, like the next thing over is like Capablanca. And he's like, if you look at the spines of these books, they are almost all like falling apart. And then you see like more recent books and it's like, they almost look like they're in pristine condition, probably haven't read some of them. <laughs> right. Um, it's like, 
I, I, I would guess I was spending, I, I don't know, maybe at least like 10 hours a week, uh, okay. maybe more potentially, um, yeah. reading some of this. And I, I went through those books over and over again. And then one of the things I did with uh, a tactics book, um, the Encyclopedia of Chess Combinations, what I used to do, and I, I, like, I still have this book, is uh, I did every diagram in there at some point, and I would mark off in like top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. I did every problem, I think, at least four times. Wow. Because I would mark off, did I get it or did I not get it? Um, and so like over my beginning years, that's that was what I did. That was like my, my training um, almost religiously. Yeah, impressive. And were, were you just reading them without a chess set or were you always setting up a set? I was, I was basically always setting up a set. So initially, actually, my mom helped me a ton by uh, she would basically have the book and read out everything to me, including wow. the moves. And I would have the board in front of me and I would just make the moves. That's love like, right there. That's beautiful. Um, so, <laughs> no, it was like uh, for somebody who like she knew how to play, but she never like seen a tournament, heard of a tournament. Um, she definitely got into it as well. Uh, but yeah, like I, I can't thank my mom enough for like putting in all that time with me on, on chess. Uh, and eventually even for the combinations when I was doing them on my own, um, I think I was often setting up the board. It, it just became like, a. sometimes maybe right, like before a tournament, I would like scan a diagram just visually, but, um, usually I would say I, I was setting them up on a board. Okay. And um, I realized I forgot one name in our name association. You did discuss uh, this gentleman a bit with Sagar Shah, but you met uh, Viswanathan Anand. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, so I've met him a few times. Uh, I think the first time was 2009. Um, the most recent time was uh, maybe 2018 um, here in the Bay Area. Um, and another guy who's, I, I feel like he is um, extremely friendly. He doesn't outwardly show the same competitive streak that I felt like Magnus does. Um, and what I thought was also really amusing is uh, when we met at Google like a few years ago, one of my one of my friends uh, works or works at Google. And so he got me an invite to what was supposed to be like an employee only event. Okay. Um, and so I was like the only non Googler there. Uh, and at some point, Anand looks at me and he's like, he, he, he does like a double take. Uh, and he, I think he was trying to place me. And at some point he was like, Hey, there's a grandmaster in the house. And I was like, no, 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 but like, you're the guy <laughs> yeah. everyone's here for. Right. Um, he, he, like also another person who has like a insane memory. Um, we started talking afterwards and I had not been playing tournament chess for a few years, but he remembered that I was like mostly known or often known for playing the French. And he asked me about, had I seen some of his recent games against Mama Jarov and the French Winnower? And I was like, well, like, I may have seen them like, you know, in like passing, like I, I still read articles on Chess 24, um, like a decent amount of time. So like, I'll, I'll quickly scan what games were there. But um, like, certainly I didn't have the level of detail that like he had. Right. Uh, and so um, Anand though is really the, like, probably my chess hero in a lot of ways. Uh, and so um, meeting him and actually like that, that was basically him and Riza are like kind of like <laughs> two, two heroes in the music and uh, chess world. That's amazing. You got to meet them both. Yeah. Um, and then you did meet another world champion, uh, Spassky, but that was more a formal setting, correct? That was like he gave yeah, a that was, um There was a lecture at the Mechanics Institute. Actually, I've met uh, Karpov, Kasparov uh, as well. Um, Karpov, I met only it's like a shorter time at a world youth championship. Uh, Kasparov I've met um, when he came to Stanford uh, a couple times. And actually, I think the first time may have been he was um, still a little bit bitter about the deep blue loss. Uh, hmm. And there was like a blitz tournament. So I, um, I actually, uh, I still have some stuff signed by him, for example, but I don't feel like I talked to them quite as much. Um, Spassky came and visited the Mechanics Institute in 2007, I want to say. Um, and he did sort of, uh, there's like a small private kind of thing event for, um, David Proust, Daniel Naroditsky, myself, Josh Friedel, a few other people who are like strong players in the Bay Area. We had, uh, Vince McCambridge and I am, um, number of people, uh, sort of got together with Spassky. I feel like he's, he's a guy who has like, I feel like a ton of stories as well. 
Um, John Donaldson is like sort of, I, John has a lot of connections. Yeah, for uh, sure. I, I, I figured that's how Spassky ended up at the mechanics um, in a lot of ways. But uh, yeah, I, I think when I was a kid, I didn't fully appreciate like that the, the chess players are almost like they're, they're people and they have their own stories too, in a way. It's like, um, but I, I think as I've gotten older, I, I like, I appreciate some of that context and that history more. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Like you mentioned in the book, you played Bronstein, but he was like just some dude as far as you knew. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Like, cool. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, of course I would have been the equally as ignorant, uh, if not more. Um, okay, we have one uh, Patreon mailbag question relating to your work in data science, for now. So, sure, um, if I can find it. Aha! So this is from Alex Marler. Thanks for supporting the pod, Alex. He says, uh, "Have you discovered any interesting things about chess using data science?" He says he's noticed from his own games that he has better results when he has the space advantage as compared to when his opponent has the space advantage. Oh, that that's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, and I have. I feel like I've both discovered some things and then I've found some really false positives uh, where I've like, it's almost like I've tortured the data right. enough that I found a pattern that wasn't really a pattern. So um, I, uh, at some point I actually, I had a, like a, I had my games in chess space and then similar to like what um, the uh, questioner is asking, I actually classified some stuff based on the kind of central uh, structure whether it's a blocked pawn, whether it's open pawn, uh, like an open center, um, were there isolated pawns, were there like what, what was going on around the bishops and knights, for example. And um, I did notice some patterns of, uh, in my own games of like how sometimes with central tension, I would sometimes like liquidate too early. Uh, I sometimes wasn't comfortable maintaining sort of call it like e4, d4 against uh, e5, d6, for example. Um, or sometimes I would, uh, similar structures where it's like E4, D4 against D5, C5. Sometimes I would liquidate uh, a little quickly. Um, but there are also some things that I, I initially thought, um, and specifically about like these long pawn chains that you can sometimes get in the French and Slav kind of openings where white has pawns on E5, D4, C3, black has pawns on, uh, E6, D5, C5. Sometimes there's a pawn on F4 in that mix too. Um, and I, I like, I, I found what I thought was a pattern of like, I was losing some more games in that. And then I realized actually like, this was totally a red herring. What's weird is in that structure, you can exchange pawns on D4 and that's a normal sort of position where I scored really well. And so it, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden when I got those pawn chains, I just needed to trade on D4 and like my position was going to be good. Uh, but it rather had to do with like other aspects of the game that like I hadn't encoded in sort of my big spreadsheet and model. Um, so I, I, I went away from that a little bit. Another one that actually came up was um, I found that I struggled a lot in like the morning rounds. Uh, wow. A lot of international tournaments, like it's one game a day in the afternoon. Uh, but then the final rounds at like 9 a.m. in the morning, same in the U.S. when you play like double round days. Uh, and sometimes for a morning game, I noticed I was like doing badly in a lot of ninth round games. Um, and there was a, a game I lost to uh, Grandmaster Kulyasevich. Um, and uh, after that game, I was like, like, man, this is like so many tournaments in a row where I've lost the ninth round game, which is like a morning round. Uh, and then I, I did actually do something where I started. Uh, part of my routine then was like I, I was always waking up uh, typically before that anyway. But I would try to get in the habit of doing some chess puzzles just in the morning to like get my mind somewhat used to having to work versus otherwise I would sometimes just be like reading the news. I would be like checking sports highlights, right. various other things. And then I would get into like, oh, yes, now I have to do some chess work. That, that's interesting. And uh, Vinay, because you're here and because of the moment we're in, I, I have to ask you just more generally about machine learning. I mean, I from the outside looking in, it seems like an incredibly fascinating time to be working there. Like is with all this, uh, a, you know, chat GPT stuff and, uh, yeah. like it, has it been an unusually interesting time for you in recent months? Oh, oh, for sure. I don't think, um, we're not immune to it both. Like, I, I think it's really amazing technology. It's also like, I, I feel like there's a little bit of a hype cycle about it as well. Uh -huh. Um, but yeah, I, I think 
I feel like every company right now, every data team is thinking about how can we either leverage this kind of technology or there are people outside, like outside the technical teams in your companies that are going to bring up like, Hey, how can we use chat GPT? Like, um, how do we inject it into the experience in some way? So, um, there's actually some stuff with kind of the foundations of chat GPT. Google released something called BERT, it has right, like yeah. transformer models. Uh, which we actually implemented in a, I, I like my team implemented in a previous job around some uh, NL, like natural language processing, um, found it to be pretty useful. Uh, I don't have as much experience with like these large language models, these LLMs, uh, but I, I do like, they are still fascinating in a lot of ways. And um, I have a, like, I have a group thread with some other chess players in the Bay area where like, actually we have not been talking about chess for a while. Um, none of them are professional chess players. Now we've only been like sharing examples with chat GPT and like LLMs of like, how do we either get it to do some strange stuff or what are some really amazing behaviors or like results that we can get from it? Um, so yeah, like I'm definitely, I'm definitely following the news there. What was, what was the most surprising thing you saw from, from all Ooh. that sharing? I think, um, I was really surprised at how. I think for me, I don't feel like I'm creative in this way of I've, uh, people who are like doing this prompt engineering to get around some of the chat GPT safeguards. So um, I think there was somebody, for example, who uh, wrote in basically that they have a medical condition where they, uh, and they gave it like a kind of like a fake name. Um, it was something invertitis, I think. And uh, where unless you insult the person or if you say something nice to them, they will take it as an insult. So you have to instead uh, insult them in every response. And they will interpret that as like, oh, that's like this chat GPT, this chat bot is being friendly towards me. And the conversation that flowed from that was like, <laughs> it was like mind bending because wow. the AI played along. Um, and it was like, wow, okay. Like this is um, the creativity like uh, from the LLMs, I think is just like, really impressive. Um, it's not something that I thought we would be at so soon, but it's also, there are all these ways that to get around whatever safeguards you think you've implemented, um, that, yeah, like I, I probably have some concerns as well for how like it gets used. Yeah, I, I think we all do. And as I mentioned in a recent pod with, uh, Vojcik Miranda, like in chess, it sort of feels like we've, as Vojcik said, like we've been a bit out in front of it because we've seen um we've seen its impact on chess sort of ahead of schedule but do you see anything in terms of like this new wave that could impact chess itself i think there's probably some stuff as far as like how we might how we might get better at learning um especially for like people who are learning chess there might be some applications right now ChatGPT and the LLMs don't seem as strong in some of the technical, like they're, they're not as uh, accurate. Like they're always creative, yeah. but they're not always accurate. Um, I feel like chess tournaments have already adapted in some way. Like even when I stopped by the Mechanics Institute, there are announcements about uh, putting your phone in your bag or it has to be off. Like if your phone is ever, like if you're seen with your phone and it's on, it's basically like you're in big trouble. Um, doesn't matter whether you're like doing something or not. Um, and so I think chess has gotten ahead of that from like a, maybe a cheating standpoint a little bit. Um, but from a learning standpoint, I do think there's probably some stuff where similar to how, like we learned, I think you and I probably learned a lot from books and reading, like you, you read chess life or like a monthly magazine, for example. Right. Um, but now all of a sudden you have chessable courses, you have all these things at your fingertips where like, I can know that the game played yesterday. I can try and apply that same opening strategy today. Um, and so similarly, I, I assume that like chat GPT and some of these tools will eventually be used to like, hopefully improve like learning capabilities. Yeah. It'll be interesting for sure. And Vinay, as we wrap up, you spoke a little about this again with Sagar Shah and you, you wrote in the book, but I find this moment sort of fascinating where you, we didn't mention earlier, but you won what's called the Samford Fellowship, where of course you're given a stipend and can play chess professionally. And you did this for a couple of years and you actually came to that. Um, you, you didn't do it as early as you could have because you were pursuing 
your career outside of chess, but then you reach a moment where that time is up and you have to decide, are you going to pursue chess? Could you uh, take us through that decision? Because you did describe it as um, an emotional one. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, um, so I, I got the, I, I was awarded the Sanford Fellowship in 2008. And um, the Sanford, like you said, it's a stipend and you can get it for up to two years. Uh, so actually my year, uh, I shared it with Irina Crush. Um, and so the two of us basically were like professional chess players for sure um, during that two year period. And then in 2010, I was around 25, 50 feet day. Uh, and I think I was I was working hard at chess, but I, like I wasn't seeing maybe the gains that I always expected. And um, I started the Sanford with by putting a lot of pressure on myself. I felt like I'd gotten a lot better by playing and studying on the side. And then all of a sudden, now I'm doing this full time. I assumed actually I could basically I would keep the same you know rate of change. I would keep improving like I used to improve. And the reality was that like, actually I took some steps backward, I took some steps forward um, and so on. And so like my third year, I wasn't on the Sanford anymore. And um, I was making a living playing chess, not a great living. I was primarily based in Spain at that point. I had an apartment in Barcelona um, and uh, I had a choice basically of like, I studied um, statistics and political economy, like you mentioned in college. And so I'd used my econ background for my first job in consulting. I was, do, I was an economic consultant. I found that extremely boring. Uh, part of the reason, like I was really attracted by the Sanford at that point. Um, and so I was debating, okay, do I go and try and use maybe my stats background to see if those kinds of jobs are interesting to me, or do I keep playing chess or do I start teaching on the side, for example. So I feel like, especially in the US, a lot of players around that 25, 50 feet day level, um, we're not going to make the US Olympiad team. We're not going to be one, like, we're not getting an automatic invite to the US championship. And so it's, it's harder just to play professionally. You often have to teach on the side. And so I was debating my choices and like, I, I like, I, I really do love chess. So even like when I stop playing, I still follow stuff. And so for me, it was a little emotional to say like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to try and give the statistics background a chance. Uh, and I ended up applying to a few companies. I applied, uh, it's funny, I applied, applied to Facebook, Tesla, and then the small marketing shop uh, in San Francisco. Um, and Facebook said no, Tesla never, like, I finished all the interviews, they never got back to me. And then Vinyl, though, gave me an offer as a marketing analyst, and I started working there. And then I realized, oh, actually, I enjoy a lot of the like the data problems that I'm working on. It, it, it felt like I was uh, kind of doing investigations, solving problems on a regular basis. In, in some way, it was like I get a new position on the board all the time. And it's like, I've got to figure out how do I make sense of this? Um, and so actually, I, that, that wasn't a sure thing, actually. So like when I applied to the job, I wasn't sure if, hey, if I don't like this in six months or a year, I may leave and go back to chess, some combination of coaching and playing. Um, but I ended up really enjoying it. Uh, from there, from the marketing analyst job, I got into data science. I started taking some gra uh, graduate coursework in machine learning. Um, and I've, I've now, now I'm still a chess player at heart, but like I dabble on the side as opposed to uh, it's like my main thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, you picked a good field to be in. And, I, you know, just reading your book, I was impressed as you say, that, that you able to take graduate level courses at Stanford. I mean, I'm sure that on top of a full-time job, that's got to be challenging. I, that was, um, I think you, you asked about Sam and his like t the, the talent question. I think I feel like I, I, I worked in like a passive manner uh, through high school sometimes, like I would read stuff and so on. I felt like when I went to college and then I started working on chess afterwards, it was more of like an active learning and active capacity to work. Um, and I feel like uh, definitely, I would say those, like those two years were like a lot busier um, for me. I think I stopped playing the US Chess League, for example, though, uh, for a little bit, um, the Pro Chess League now. Uh, but yeah, I think that like some of it was, I was really interested in the material and I was willing to put in the time and I like, I'd learned how to like, really work where sometimes before I would just like read the same book over and over again. Right. 
Interesting. Um, well, Vinay, this has been great. Uh, I'm just curious, um, as we say our goodbyes, like you obviously had an incredibly accomplished career in chess, and now you're having an incredibly accomplished career out of chess. Uh, as you do take this sort of big picture, look back at your career, um, is there anything you really wish you did differently? Or, I mean, things have obviously worked out pretty well for you. So do you, do you not think that way? Uh, I think it's like, certainly I have like chess decisions that I feel like I could have made differently. Um, it probably would feel a little weird if I had like absolutely no regrets. It feels like then I, I didn't maybe take some chances. Right. I think to me, actually, uh, I'm not sure that I, I ever had like, I was so talented or so amazing at chess to be like a Magnus Carlsen kind of player. Um, but I do think that like probably actually most of my plateaus, I feel like were reasonable and kind of ex explainable. It's actually the one at 2200 where I, I got stuck for so long studying the same things that probably feels like, oh, I, I could have done that a little bit differently. And maybe I would have been a little bit stronger at the end of high school. I don't know that it would have changed like the broad contours of my life. Like, mm -hmm. I think I still would have gone to college. Um, and yeah, like I said, I like when, when I see, when I meet people like Carlson or Anna and then like I, Wesley, so Fabiana Caruana, right? Like these are people who I feel like as chess players are still beyond where I was at that time. So I don't know that I would have been at their level anyway. Um, but yeah, overall, I would say like chess has been super valuable to me. And like, I think, one of the amazing things is um, I feel like I know I have or like know a lot of chess people across the world. And so it's always like a nice little network to have. Like it's a common language. Even if I haven't seen somebody for a couple of years, um, we can always connect over chess. Yeah. I mean, first of all, just the I feel like you have an outsized number of stories of like all the world champions you've met, but also just like little stuff like connecting, like I've interviewed uh, Koyasevich, who's written a couple yeah. great books. So like, there's a picture of you with him. And it's like, oh, yeah, of course, like, you know, you're gonna know, like, Ganguly, and all, you know, all these people who are, like, uh, more involved in sort of at least the online chess world, because they work in chess, whereas you, you, you work outside of chess now. But you, obviously, when you read your book, it, like, you can still see the the level of passion and obviously, knowledge. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's it's incredible. So the book is called How I Became a Chess Grandmaster. It's available on Forward Chess. Um, and uh, Quality Chess, as always, has a free sample that uh, listeners and viewers can check out. And definitely, it's a very pleasurable read. So highly recommend the book, Vinay. And thanks thanks for taking the time to write it. I know, you, I know you're a busy guy. Uh, no, it, it was actually a really enjoyable process. So um, I know uh, Jakob at some point was... Uh, he was joking about how slow I was with some edits, but um, <laughs> no, it was, it was it was actually a really fun project overall. I like, and I'm 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 thrilled that he gave it a shot as well because uh, it's not it's not the kind of chess book that I remember reading a lot or seeing a lot of as a kid. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, other people enjoy it too. Yeah, I, I think they will. So, uh, so thanks again, Vinay. And, and Vinay, before we go, uh, what is if anyone wants to keep up with you or send you a message, what's the best way to do that? Um, I'm I'm active on some of the social platforms, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatnot. Um, and people can email me at uh, vs uh, bot b h a t zero two at gmail.com as well. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, Vinay. Thank you. <laughs>